Curious collectors and the curious. We're all pretty excited to be here. We've got a nice group going for Ricardo's 60th episode of Tuesday Feels. To all our friends, followers, anyone new here, let us know where you're watching from in the YouTube chat. Or um, why don't you comment one of your favorite things about our show, and we'll be sure to watch a chat throughout. Uh, beyond live shows just like this, you guys can watch all of our Reinventing Network shows, art jams, drawing groups, interviews, panels, and webinars on our website at reinventingthetattoo.com, our YouTube channel, as well as the new Roku channel. Um, if you haven't checked us out on Roku yet, you can find it by searching for Reinventing the Tattoo on your Roku device for 24-7 streaming content. This is really nice to put on in the background for yourself and your clients while you're tattooing. Um, yeah, lots of stuff. We have several weekly shows and drawing groups that are happening literally every day. If you're watching, you're welcome to tune in or join the Zoom call with us. The link to that Zoom is easy to find. Um, all you have to do is go to reinventingthetattoo.com, scroll down to our calendar, and the Zoom links are right in there. If you guys are just here to watch, uh, the YouTube channel is set up for reminders about all of these upcoming events. Uh, Sundays at one, we have Skill Building Sundays led by Jason Leeser, who is with us, I believe so already. Uh, Monday mornings start early at nine with Drawing for Tattooers led by James Wisdom. Right after that at 11, you can join myself, Gabe Ripley, and Jake Meeks of Fireside Tattoo to talk about what's going on in the world of tattooing when we have also frequent special guests. Next week will be Tara Quinn. Later on at five is Robbie Rapole's Let's Talk About Feelings. And at 9 p.m. is a Reinventing Evolution class. And yeah, that's a lot of uh, information about that can be found um, about our canon on reinventingthetattoo.com. Um, also, Tuesdays right here at 10 is Ricardo Sturdivant's Tuesday Feelings. Wednesdays at noon is our Tattoo Now show, followed by our business course every other Wednesday at 1. As you guys know, also right here on Thursdays at 6 is Tattoo Collecting 101, streamed live from True Tattoo Supply in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, before we kick off, we'll just shout out some of our sponsors today for helping us get this content out to you guys. We've got World Tattoo Events, the best resource for tattoo events in the world. We've got D-Lives Pro, um, helping protect their art. Of course, Tattoo Now, thanks Gabe for the, all the stuff that you're working on uh, helping tattooers and the inspiration behind Reinventing the Tattoo, Guy Aitchison. Um, you can find his Biomech Encyclopedia, machines, paintings, and more on his website at guyaitchison.com. Also, thanks to our affiliates, the Fireside Tattoo, Apprenticeship Diaries, and Eco-Friendly Tattoo Supplies.com. All right. Well, guys, uh, we've got a good little group going. Uh, Jason, I haven't seen your beautiful face yet, but good morning. Amber, good morning. Fawn, how's good it morning. going? Doing pretty good. Hello, everybody. How's everybody's day today? Pretty good. Good. Nice to hear. Very good to hear. Very good to hear. Jason, the man, the myth, huh? the legend. <laughs> I have not had coffee yet. Oh, okay. Just fair warning. That's All right. Funny. Having my yeah. first cup. I'm Me too. <laughs> I'm on I'm... my second. Okay, so yeah. that leads us to uh, shall we be trying to find like a uh, coffee uh, people to plug? Uh, we always go back and forth with sponsors and stuff. Do you guys want a reinventing coffee? <laughs> yeah. One of my Dude. friends has a coffee company. We should That's get what I'm thinking. Like reinventing good... the tattoo K cups. Yes. <laughs> okay, it's not so uh, high caffeine uh, like Death Wish coffee. Well, okay, so here's yes. the thing, I suppose. Uh, you guys know the, uh, I guess it's some, somewhat tattoo related to uh, Billy and Joe, the, the fucking Green Day guys have a yeah. uh, coffee company and it's awesome. And, and the, they're eco-friendly, biodegradable Keurig fucking things, whatever they're called. I don't even use, I don't, nice. I don't care about coffee, right? So they're, they, they do great coffee. I, I could see what it is inside or somebody could do a search real quick maybe, but um, it's great. My, well, my wife has been drinking it for years now. They, I almost did some website work for them, but I was like, I don't drink coffee. I don't know. But uh, eco friendly, they're tattoo, you know, friendly. They're, uh... oh. Sorry, and when you get my... done, when you get done with the coffee in them, you can always fill them up with black ink. And you can oh, yeah. use those as like your dip caps for like 143 <laughs> mags. Yeah, there you go. You'd almost need it. You'd almost need that. Yeah. Yeah. Or like a, a small Dixie cup or something. You or can you have... can just do what. Uh, an old school guy I used to know do whenever he was using a massive mag, he used to just take the bottle, wrap the bottle in plastic, take the cap off, and then he would just pour ink into the mag as he was working. Because like, it, if you cut the bottom of a solo cup off and use that, inevitably you're going to end up wasting more ink. Not that you're not going to by using a mag that big anyway, 
Yeah. But you're going to end up going through and wasting so much ink that it's ridiculous. So the one way that he found to like get around that, I think mostly just because he was really stingy, um, was to actually just like pick up the bottle and like pour it into the well of the massive mag as he was working. Yeah, that's that's one way to do it, man. That sounds like a lot of a little bit of like a few extra steps though. I've always yeah. used like those old paper cups, you know what I mean? Like the, the rinse out spit cups that you get the dentist or something. Dude, I used to go to Wendy's and get like a stack of those like small little ketchup cups. That's the one that I'm talking about. Those are yeah, the, dude. Yeah. The little paper fold up cups. Right. So those back. things were perfect. But you can get whole packs of these medicine cups. You can get like 300 of them for two bucks. There so, you know. And they're not paper. So you don't have to worry about your ink bleeding through them. But like, I still happen to have, I think somebody, his name was Frazier. I think he left them with me, but I've got these awesome pain kit. But I call them hot tubs. They're like hot tub for ink. Yeah. Oh, nice. Those are awesome. A 49. They'll have room to spare so if i'm doing like big blackout work i'll set up two of these and that's enough to get me through the night usually yeah so if you look around there are some really giant ink caps i've also got some big ones that are like two inches across and maybe like three quarters of an inch deep so they're like wider but shallow those are really really nice um hmm. but like i said i'm not sure where Fraser got those I, he just kind of left them when you know he was working with me and then moved on so i Years, but, but there I think are I used to, those are awesome they're perfect those big red caps i think i used to get some from icon way back in the day but i'm not even sure if they carry them anymore or not i think it was icon well the I other thing Cam used to have them too who? i've talked about before how we just kind of have to borrow things from other industries like these are like yeah two like hose ends like um pipe caps uh, yeah pipe caps yeah. that's what they're um, yeah. so I'm, and I'm from like, I don't know if you have them, but other industrial like resource companies would definitely have them and even cheaper than what you would get them for through a tattoo company, usually. Well, nowadays you add the word tattoo to anything and you can mark it up by like 80 bucks. Yeah, yeah. So. for sure. You want yeah. an ink shaker? Cool. $250. Oh, you want a a laboratory grade test tube agitator, 60 bucks. Do you want a tattoo grade agitator for permanent makeup? $1,472. Uh huh. <laughs> and 63 99 cents. cents. 99 cents. You got to mark it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now it, anything for permanent makeup is like double the cost. Oh, I know. And I'm like, like, closer to triple. Yeah, I, th yeah. I think you got the, the there's a got to be a little bit of a um, like rhyme and reason to that because the cosmetic like the permanent makeup industry has exploded so quickly like before there were enough practitioners who could do it well so I think people just started ordering PMU equipment because it wasn't very expensive and they started mutilating each other so now the whole industry is like well hold on we can't sell these machines for 60 bucks well, hold on. We can't sell these little tiny vials of ink this inexpensively. Hold on. We've got to specialize this more. Yeah, it sucks, doesn't it? Like people taking advantage of, of uh, cultures. Like tattooing kind of sucks. Yeah, it's a funny, it's a funny thing within the politics of tattooing right now. Like technically is permanent tattoo or is permanent makeup like cosmetic tattooing tattooing yes but it's like a whole different culture it's a whole different set of rules it's a whole different you know i'd love to see somehow for it to be split into two industries all together but i don't definitely not custom really yeah, no. I, don't. I mean it's a skill like you do have to be good at it do it permanently but it's not i don't know it should be a totally different it should be it should be in a category of its own and with its own laws and its own politics and its own everything. But unfortunately, we have to share that pool right now. I agree with you completely. Um, 
are you guys all working on? I am looking at some old videos that I've taught uh, in the past classes and stuff like that. I've had some people reach out and want to know about like some of the uh, composition stuff that I do and some of the um, the drawing techniques and stuff like that. And I thought I'd kind of go over some of the things, those things with you guys a little bit later. How about you guys? What are y'all working on? James, good morning. How good to see you, man. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm drawing some, some drawings. I'm just, I'm having a good time, uh, just make some new compositions today. So I have a, I have an appointment later on. Um, but, uh, other than that, I'm, you know, I'm kind of off for the day today. So I can't wait to see your videos, Ricardo, get them all edited up and Make them, make them into podcasts or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. Nope. Um, Somebody see. doing bong hits or something? What's, oh, Jason's... No, what's going on? There? What's the sound back there? It's either got to be coffee or bong. The coffee maker. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> okay. I'll go on you. All good, all good. No, 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 it's good. I had my tea maker in the back, and I was just wondering. I was like, oh, man, I'm missing out the party. <laughs> the coffee maker bong is hits. taking bong it's hits, man. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, all right. Well, I've had a pretty busy week. I've been working on some pretty big pieces recently, um, and they've been a lot of fun. Uh, the only thing that sucks about it is sometimes they're in such stages of like uh, completion that it's hard to get photos of them. You know what I mean? So I haven't been able to post too many photos or anything like that lately, and that's always kind of a bummer. But um, here, I think I'll just show, let me share some of this stuff real quick. Um, let's see. How do you share the screen? Let's go up here, share content screen. Bear with me. If any of you guys are watching, um, let us know what you're working on too. No surprise, I'm working on some watercolors. You know, I almost set up my watercolors today, Amber. I uh, I no. had everything laid out, and then I was, like, brainstorming about what I was going to sketch and what I was going to start. And I was like, you know what? I need to wrap up a couple of these oil paintings I've had going for a while. So, got yeah. the oils. I'm not even really sure what I'm painting. I did an abstract background, and now I'm just letting the background decide where the paint's going. I mean... That's the definition of playing, right? Just seeing yes. what happens and where it goes. I love painting like that. We've got like, I feel like when we tattoo, we always have so many goals and so many objectives. So it's almost yeah. like therapy for me to just start with a blank slate and then just apply color and see what it wants to turn into. Not like what I want this piece to be, but like what it already wants to be, what it already is. Mm hmm. It's I'm having such a great time with it. It's always fun to do just sit down and start doodling. And I've seen uh, James kind of describe that in his classes about like just doing some circles some lines and stuff like that, getting kind of warmed up and everything. And sometimes you can do that. Definitely do that with. Uh, with your paintings and drawings and stuff, too. I love it. All right. So let's see here. So first thing. Oh, you're pulling that up, Ricardo. Um, let's all say hi to Atomic and thanks for watching. Hopefully, you can join us again soon. What's up, dude? Uh, it's been a while, yeah. man. All right. So first of all, any of the things that I'm going to be talking about right now isn't anything new. Um, I think last week we talked about Da Vinci and stuff like that in James's class, uh, and a couple other master painters, master artists, and stuff like that. Um, so this is kind of where I get some of my information from. Um, you can see the Ventruvia man. Perfect. Um, and all these letters. What's that? Oh. Um, but this is the this is kind of what I base a lot of my composition off of. Uh, this this symbol right here, this geometric tree of life. 
Uh, you can see the balance of it inside the human figure. Uh, and this is kind of where I take the ideas for my composition. Um, let me see here. Let me go ahead and get a different brush here. We're going to get those forms. Let's just take an arm, for example. I think I went over this in one other class, but uh, we'll go over it again. Is this okay sideways like this, or should I tilt it up the other way? If you can tilt it and rotate it, that would be great. Is that better? Okay. Go back. This way. Better? Yep. Cool. Perfect and definitely worth doing, taking the time to do it. So whoever made that happen, perfect. Cheers. Good. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and show this one more time. This symbol right here, the shape here. Is exactly what I'll use to lay out a composition. You can see how I've matched the points inside of these intersecting angles on the on the um, on the on this uh, seat of life. I think that there's a good amount of energy that kind of comes through in the, in the translation of some of these images whenever they're drawn up. Whenever you use this process, I do anyway. So I always make sure and concentrate. That same shape, man, I am not doing well today. To kind of frame things out. We were talking a little bit ago about like discovering where things go. Sometimes staring at a blank piece of paper and things like that are very intimidating. Uh, I find that this helps me out quite a bit whenever I go to lay out my composition for ideas for tattoos. This can be moved around just about anywhere too. I'm drawing this one. This pattern can be laid out throughout the whole arm. All you do is follow this, this that same angle and all points should intersect whenever it starts to wrap around the arm or leg or chest, anywhere really. Um, I always end up trying to draw to follow these angles as well. So let's say like somebody wants a skull or a face. So you can see how the shoulders are following this, these lines of intersecting angles. Got a little smiley face on this dude. <laughs> But one of the more interesting things that I liked was um, outside of the composition was breaking down things into simple shapes. I've always talked about this. I've always discussed this with everybody that I've talked to. We, Jason and I have talked about this pretty extensively. And I think we were talking about it last week too. Jason was like um, taking 
uh, your ideas and trying to break them down into simple shapes so that way you can kind of like sketch a little bit faster. You had talked about that a little bit. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is simple shapes turning into form. And the only reason that that happens is because we're introducing light into this simple shape, right? So I always try to break things down into three as well. Um, three simple shades. The simpler, the better. That way we don't get lost in a lot of information. I've also found out through the years of tattooing that it helps out uh, hold up the longevity of the tattoo as well. Whenever I do black and gray, I'm primarily trying to focus on black, medium tone, and like a light wash, depending on the skin tone of the person. These simple shapes can turn into these, these concepts. Anytime we take any kind of complex image, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, we're gonna blur our eyes at it. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna help us find those simple, simple shapes. <coughs> You can see I kind of like scumbled through these things to kind of show that as an example. Um, I like to call it blocking or scumbling. Let's see if we can't play the video. Basically what I do is like I go through and do those simple shades like we talked about and start isolating the, the shapes into smaller and smaller forms. I also use this as an example as well, these skulls. You can see how I have the composition mapped out. I've shown you where I see those simple geometric angles. And I'm using those as anchor points or plotting points to help a proportion. And placement relationship to each other. Yeah, so that's basically it. Any questions? No? Okay. An <laughs> elegant solution from a more civilized age. <laughs> <laughs> yes. When James was talking about the symmetry and or the lack of symmetry in the face the other day, the first thing I thought of was the Vitruvian man. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's such a rad drawing, the way you broke it all down. Mm -hmm. We think of things like so organically, you know what I mean? Like we think of the form and the and the uh, the face and like the body and stuff like that in such an organic, in-depth kind of perception, you know what I mean? But when you break it down into all these simple angles, you can really start to see how they relate to each other. And like the only reason that it's looking in form is because of the, the fact that there's light, right? There's no dark without the light. So we, we break it down into those simple shapes and it helps us out a lot. It helps me out quite a bit. Um, let's see. Yeah, I dig it. Have, yeah, have you ever heard of a dynamic symmetry? Have you ever heard of this concept? Uh-uh. Dynamic symmetry? 
Uh, it's very, uh, it's related to what, um, it's related to this, uh, to this sacred geometry that you're talking about. And, uh, and I think, um, and so a lot of, uh, um, a lot of times, uh, you know, uh, old paintings are sort of analyzed this way, but I think, you know, uh, a lot of designers still kind of use some of these, uh, some of these ideas too. Um, uh, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can share my screen or not, but um, let me see if, I, if I'm allowed to. Ah, cool. I will share. So there's just some examples of, uh, of dynamic symmetry. Um, essentially, um, let's see, I think this one, this one kind of shows with, within like, you know, building out like a golden section. And yeah. so uh, starts with squares and then, you know, uh, this is like two squares on top. This, you know, this one here, if I can, if I can zoom in. This one here is basically like two squares on top of each other and where they, you know, this overlapping part is uh, be a golden section. So this would be like a golden rectangle. Um, yeah. But it's, uh, so there's a, I think there's a relationship. Um, there's a relationship to, to, um, to exactly the things that you were talking about. Um, and I just, I find this interesting. I, I will lay out, uh, I'll lay out compositions this way, but I'll also use it to sort of divide, like, um, uh, you know, when you want to divide something into thirds or something, let's say, um, it's, uh, it can be really hard to like get out a rule, you know, like get out a ruler and do all the mathematics and sort of figure out like how, you know how does, how can I break this down into thirds? Um, but you can of course like you can use geometry and you can you know you can apply it to um, to any quadrangle, square, rectangle, whatever. And you know it's it's based on the intersection of the lines. Again, it's a it's it's a it's a technique. It's a it's a it's a math trick. But it's um, you know once you learn it, it's real easy and you can go through with it. Um, but I agree with you wholeheartedly about this, you know, this relationship we share to mathematics, especially in, you know, image making practices. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, that's basically what we're, basically what we're doing is sort of organizing maths in a certain way. You know, I, I guess I always felt growing up, like I wasn't, I wasn't any good at doing math. But yeah, me neither. Was, me neither, man. I love my life. It's well, funny, well, that's what they say. Like the back, the backbone of math is something that I know Ricardo, you're very, very good with is music and um, oh, different types you. of ways that an art such is the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like something so so pleasing to the ear can be broken down into like scales and things like that, right? Yeah, same principles. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, and I think James, what you're showing too is like a there's a book I think John Berger wrote. It. It's called The Way of Seeing. And I picked that up a while back. It's a real little book. It's it's awesome. If you guys get a chance, pick it up. Look it up on the internet. See if you can find it. Um, but it breaks some things down into like the, with the composition, for example, like what you're showing uh, as far as approaching like a canvas. You know how how we're gonna make the the image so much more interesting by the placement of the of the subject matter. You know what I mean? And that that relates to us as tattoo artists, especially when people come in and they have a plethora they got like a, a small binder organized full of like these ideas and this one tattoo they want that they want it in like you know softball size shape you know what I mean so it's up to us to kind of break it down and like one of the things that I do is I always try to think of uh subjects and details in a tattoo in a tertiary kind of way you know what I mean where there's like three main pieces that we want to take away from everything that you want you know we want the main focal point we want secondary and we want the third to kind of be like a relationship uh, as far as tying those first two images together a little bit better you know what i mean um so the the omnitrium perfectum i think is what it's called right the rule of three that's definitely yeah. something that i try to i try to follow pretty religiously and it seems to be effective you know what i mean it seems to be pretty pretty effective whenever you're trying to translate what it is that somebody wants in their tattoo especially with like um the idea of trying to become more of a storyteller through the images rather than just like a, a copier you know 
or like a copy machine, a fax machine or whatever it is, you know what I mean? That you could think of as some, in terms of some people bringing you in images and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we want to try to push. I think for me, what I'm trying to do these days is like trying to push, push that envelope for myself a little bit more in, in conveying like emotions and things like that that can come through with an image rather than you having to read it. You know what I'm saying? Like you've been able to see it and objectively feel an emotion with it. And I think that's one of the things that we can do to um, help out for me if, to help out with that process. I think there's a lot of intention too, you know, like for instance, you know, like, you know, if you use that like rule of thirds, which I think it, it adds a lot of uh, interest and beauty, you know, you could, um, you know, you may come up with something that has balance rather than symmetry or something. But sometimes people, you know, sometimes are, you know, people really want like something very symmetrical or, you know, like sort of focused, like, a, you know, like, uh, that's always something that I've always heard. Like if you have a composition and you put something right in the dead center, the geometrical center of the, of the, uh, you know, of your canvas, your page or whatever body makes it static. Yeah. But I mean, it's, but, and that's true, but it's also makes it contemplative. You know, it also makes it sort of powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, so we want, you know, I think maybe, maybe it's bringing together both of those things is what, you know, um, uh, that actually, that actually maybe makes it, you know, transcendent in some way, you know, where there is, there is both this sort of, you know, this contemplative <laughs> sort of centeredness with, with something dynamic about it. Um, and yeah, no, I think, yeah, there's a lot of geometry that can, that can help you get there rather than stumbling around all the time. We need experiments and stuff, but like, you know, uh, but then there's been a, there's been a lot of a lot of work and a lot of thought that's gone into you know how to how to do these things and so I th I don't know I think you're right I think there's a think we need to push ourselves and you know look look at the work of others and see how see how that works yeah you know, that might help us uh, you know figure out our own way there was a guy that I knew that was um he he taught at ISU for a little while at Illinois State University in the art department. And um, really cool guy. He ended up moving up to Canada and uh, started doing printmaking and things like that and installation art. I think I've talked about this before, but he was talking about how this this idea and this method had been so imprinted on his his uh, perspective of taking in paintings and, and how to construct them and things like that and making effective paintings that every time he went to go look at paintings now, all he did was really just like dissect it. You know what I mean? Like that's all he did is would just see nothing but those angles and stuff like that. Like he couldn't enjoy the painting anymore. You know what I mean? He was like, he hated it so much. He's like, I, I felt like, man, his paintings were amazing too. They're incredible, but, and like massive too, like these huge wall paintings, you know what I mean? But like, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a fine edge. You know what I mean? It's good to use it as the, as the, the, the structure, the backbone and things like that, but don't get caught too much into it. You know, um, try to stay organic and stuff like that within the process. For sure. I agree, but all, you know, but we're all like we're tattooers, so like you know, when you look at a tattoo, like I mean, I guess you know you're gonna look at it and think about how it was done. <laughs> you know, what I mean? you're gonna think right. about the technical stuff. Um, right. So I guess you have to allow yourself to enjoy. Yeah. You know, like again, you're gonna you're gonna find all that mm, all the technical stuff, all the things that like pertain to uh, your knowledge. Yeah. But there's that whole, that, that whole other half of you. So your, you know, your professor that you're talking about is like, um, I mean, it, I, it, he was just, he was right there, but he was wrong. Yeah. Wrong yeah. not to let himself enjoy. Yeah, you exactly. Know? Yeah. Totally. Brilliant, brilliant yeah. to see that. Brilliant to be able to like, uh, to integrate that into his work, but he was wrong to not enjoy the mm -hmm. beauty of what others have done. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the lesson probably. I think it's one of those things, right? Like it's part of the journey of ourself as a, as a person and as an artist is to to go through those those fumbling points, right? Like those those roadblocks and things like that. You know what I mean? Um, and the craziest part too is like a lot of it had to do with esteem, like his self esteem too. You know, like I'm not good enough. You know what I mean? I'm not good enough. You know what I mean? And it, it's that was another part of his process, dude. You know what I mean? And I'm sure at some point in time, 
I don't know about you guys, but there's sometimes I'll just start a drawing, start a painting and set it aside and it'll sit there. Like I literally had a, a this dragon oil painting that I did sold it over quarantine and that thing sat in my studio for four years, dude, like no joke, just staring at me. You know what I mean? Every time I walk by, it's like, oh, you bastard. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like eventually um, I was just learning oils and things like that. You know what I mean? And here I am trying to take on this like two by four foot painting. You know what I mean? And like, uh, so I had to learn about some of the glazing techniques and like, and things like that in order to achieve what it was that the overall, the overall like look for the painting. You know what I mean? So until I learned that, then it started falling into place a little bit more. But it's just like that. Like I could have crumpled it up and thrown it away and never and never learned through that process. It took four years, but I did it. You know what I mean? Sometimes it just takes a little bit more time. Uh, I do have a question for you guys. So I I've I've known a lot of tattoo artists to start with thumbnails. And I used to do that too. You know what I mean? And I think what I'm going with here is I wanted to ask you guys, with the idea of composition being able to lay out the image that you have in your head. Like for me, it's, it's helped me kind of place things in a general shape in a silhouette almost. Uh, and I'm able to like lay things out a little bit quicker because of that. I'm able to work through the process of where I have the placement of the subject matter and things like that. Do you guys think that the thumbnail helps with the composition or do you think it helps with the overall image? I think like, both. Okay. Yeah. Um, for me, for me, that initial thumbnail that I sit and put together, because usually I put that together right there with my client and then like, I'll build my mock-up off of that. But usually I'll have my iPad open with my mock-up and then I'll have my sketchbook open too, with that scribbly little thumbnail, because like that thumbnail is like our first, it's like our first roadmap towards the idea. You know what I mean? Like that's the first, that's the first directions, turn right here, turn left there. You know, that's our first, like that's the most important parts of the idea. That's, you know, all the little notes that you talk, well, for me, like all the little notes that I talk about on the side, like, you know, what different things represent, but like in that thumbnail, there's so much more information than just like the scribbly drawing that somebody else would see. Like sometimes my, my thumbnails are literally like, I draw like little triangular Christmas trees and stick people, but like, yep. have initial thing right there just kind of like keeps me locked into our initial conversation um but it also kind of like it's just kind of like the anchor for the whole project like all the goals are right there so when I'm looking at this huge daunting sleeve and then I look back over at that scribbly little thumbnail it's like oh no it's only this element this element and this element and then the background no problem you know like I think that thumbnail is like um incredibly crucial like through the whole process for me okay cool. hey guys i'm gonna let uh wit into the room here i think it's her first time on zoom all right let's see if it works Sweet. out but well said fun nice i'm not the newbie anymore <laughs> <laughs> amber yep. i still feel like a newbie here kidding me this is the 60th episode ricardo I can't believe it, man. It's yeah, you're incredible. you're past you're past your fiftieth episode, man. Like you were no longer in that beginner category. Not yeah. anymore. It's insane. It still feels the same way, though. <laughs> oh Good man! To know. Every time, right before the right before we go live, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Fawn will tell you that doesn't change. No matter how many of these you do. All of us could attest to that, I think. Everyone yeah. here. Absolutely. Maybe it's because I smoke so much before I go live. Like, I'm ready, like, ready to go <laughs> and, like, fully in the mode. But, like, it's not. <laughs> like, the only time it's nerve-wracking is, like, if there's something being glitchy with the technology, which does happen. But usually, like, that's the only thing. Like, I don't know. But then again, I guess I don't have a lick of stage fright, so that's awesome lucky i know tell me about it man because i'm like i sweat bullets like no joke <laughs> I'm like, oh, you know, it's, it's funny i was sitting there like thinking and listening to you talking about of, like the design principles that you were sharing today i was reflecting back to like my earliest years 
my mom uh, was a, a high style floral designer. So okay. she worked with exotics and like the, the expensive stuff that not all floral designers have the chance to work with. Um, so like when I go to work with her, she'd show me how she would be laying out bases and she'd have like these sketches and these sketches were different geometric layouts. And these are just for flowers. My mom's six feet tall, so she's a tall woman, but she makes very tall, like grandiose arrangements out of like minimal flowers, just because like, she's always thinking about when your eye looks at this, what and where are those pops of colors going to be? And, you know, I just remember her, and again, floral design is totally different from tattooing, but the, the connection is it's all design and it's all layout and it's all like using those principles of like, what are our three main focal point flowers? Okay, so we build the whole arrangement around those three flowers, three pops of color. Um, and the thing is, I've always, I've always just kind of thought that it was um, like, like innate, like my design and balance, but just listening to you talk and hearing you explain some of the same things and the same ways that she did when I was a little kid, it, me, it just made me realize that it wasn't fairly instinctive. It was just taught so young that I didn't realize that like all of these geometric principles were right there in front of me the whole time. And, you know, like not everybody at the age of three is being explained the principles of balance you know, but yeah, hmm. just a cool, just a cool connection I made while you were talking. Well, that's good, man. I'm glad to hear that. That That's one of the things that trips me out the most about what my observation on my life has been is like these little, these little seeds being planted, you know what I mean? And sometimes you don't see that, that blossom or that tree grown until like much, much later, you don't pay attention yep. to it. You know what I mean, And all of a yep. sudden it's just like, boop it comes from back here and just exits out the mouth or through the eyes or through your hands you know what i mean it's incredible thanks for sharing that with us i appreciate that it's awesome yeah. hello medusa hello whitney how's everybody hello. doing oh we got medusa too hey Whit. hi hey. sorry i'm a late join i hit the snooze alarm and then i turned it off and then I just slept. <laughs> I miss being able to do that. Exactly what I did. Well, Medusa, it's been a good show so far. Um, Ricardo was getting uh, technical. I know you probably would have enjoyed. So good that you're here. Yay. Yeah. Whitney. Two running prints. So. Yes. Good morning. Welcome to Zoom. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Hello. Sorry, I'm a little bit late. I did the same thing with you today. Um, comes early. Where are you coming in from? You go on the West Coast uh, as well? I'm, I'm on the East Coast. Uh, well, not really coast. I'm in Ohio. Uh, oh, okay. Probably about, I don't know, an hour from Derbs. About an hour, 45 minutes. A town called Radical. Worcester. Yeah. Radical. Well, welcome. It's getting cold yeah. here. Thank oh, you. Oh, yeah, we are talking about that this morning. It sucks, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, we're experiencing fall. We're starting to get our fall days in, which is only going to last a couple of weeks before it's nine months of sludge. Ugh. So, yeah, I've been walking to work lately, enjoying the fall days, but I won't be able to do that soon because I'm looking out my window now and it is gray and dreary, so... Mm. It's that time. Painting season's arrived. <laughs> News button and all, right? <laughs> so, I'm, not, I'm not looking forward to being soggy. Yeah. Yeah, it has rained for four days here, and I am so over it. Yeah. And it's supposed to rain for most of the week. As long as there's uh, no man. bottom boys. Soggy bottom boys. Soggy bottom, soggy bottom socks. Oh my god! <laughs> it's like nothing will ruin your day, like getting a little bit of water in your boot. Oh yeah, dude, totally. Seriously, <laughs> yes, this is like, I have never yeah, gone no, no, from no such a pleasant the winter. Yeah, no, really I've never gone is. from such a pleasant mood to such a horrible mood in seconds just because of like a splash of a puddle got inside my boot. Oh, and it'll be so rest, wet for the rest of the day. 
<laughs> it sucks so bad, dude. You're tattooing <laughs> and your one foot is cold and wet and the other one is like dry. You're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you in a bad mood no man just one of my feet it's wet sorry <laughs> <laughs> only one only one yeah exactly uh, just one of them and they're like oh yeah we relate we get it <laughs> um so i had proposed the question earlier if uh, what you guys think are is more important do you guys do you guys rely on on thumbnail sketches for your composition or do you find them better for your ideas or how does it work for you guys and Fawn had talked about uh, the importance for her. I was wondering if you guys could kind of elaborate and see see where y'all were at with that question. As uh, far as composition. I, don't know. I feel like it's more uh, more ideas, I suppose. I would say more ideas, like for yeah. the drawing itself. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I use mine mostly for layout. So if I'm struggling to say someone wants, you know, something, you know, rather large scale, I always like to thumbnail first instead of sitting down and just starting to sketch super huge. Yeah. Um, I find that it really helps with layout and design principles. Um, just helps you get a better flow of it, you know, in the long run. Um, I don't really, I, I may take that concept and then I may, you know, tweak little things here and there, but generally speaking, I always like to lay out like a little nine square grid before I go through and do my final drawing rule of thirds, you know, left third, middle third, right third, top third, middle third, bottom third. And I try to make sure that there's going to be something interesting in each. Um, I think Jeff Gogway talked about that in one of his older seminars. Uh, but you know, I like to go through and do my thumbnails in that manner just so that I know it's going to be visually interesting and it's going to flow well. I know the general overall flow I want things to have, but by starting out super, super small, it allows you to really kind of break things down and say, well, I can't put that there because now that doesn't look right. And I can't do that there because now that doesn't look right. So what do I need to work on in what area, you know? Right. So I, I like it for more conceptual and layout design as opposed to, you know, like creating these super tiny little final renderings to say, here's a whole bunch of different concepts. Yeah. But that's Well, and you know. being around you and working with you, I've seen that your approach is very technical too. You know what I mean? I, yeah. Got, yeah. Um, I, I tend to overdo the technical aspect a lot. <laughs> it's awesome though, man. Cause like, I mean, the, the first time that we laid out that back piece, it fit perfectly. You know what I mean? Like yeah. your approach to it was we had the concept and then you were able to put it into the, the um, process that you use for your iPad and man, dude, it was spot on. Like there was no reprinting stencil, nothing. It was just like, boom, right there. I was like, Oh my God, this has never happened before ever. Yeah. So yeah, so it's pretty incredible to see that too. Like I to be able to be around that. Like mine, mine is pretty loose and things like that. You know what I mean? So it's definitely taken away some uh, of those of those practices for myself, and it's helped out quite a bit with the stencils, man. So it's awesome. Yeah. But um, I do think that it is important, though. Like the shapes. You know what I mean? I keep going back to these simple shapes. You know what I mean? And a lot of times people say draw smaller first and then make it large. I'd like to try to make them large, like just the largest part of the silhouette as possible. You know what I mean? To see how much space that's going to take up, where it's going to lay on the, on the interesting part of the arm, especially with us, we're dealing with dimension as well. You know, as tattoo artists, we're dealing with like the way things are going to warp, the way things are going to wrap. I mean, how many times have you guys? Uh, I agree. Up, yeah. How many times have you guys drawn up images and you go to lay them on the arm and it's like, I got to, move this entire part of the stencil because it's like the hand is like way longer than what it should be you know what i mean or like yeah drawing that larger to begin with it, it already gives you an idea of what, how much space you're going to take in the first place yeah well, I, I have that problem yeah mm -hmm. yep um and then i think that's something that builds up for us as well over time and experience through going through those those um those problems when they arise you know Either somebody teaches you about that to begin with, or like me, you kind of went through that process and had to learn that 
you got to draw a little bit differently because of it. You know what I mean? And it's, it's interesting because of my tattooing, I have learned to draw quite a bit differently than what I used to for sure. You know what I mean? When I was a kid, you know, we, I moved around a lot. So I was just always in the corner drawing by myself, just copying everything I could, you know what I mean? And then trying to apply that same idea to a tattoo image was it's almost like night and day, you know what I mean? Because of the fact that things do warp, things do turn. It, does, it is on a living organism, you know what I mean? So, yeah. What about you, James? How do you approach it? Um, well, I, you know, I'm, I kind of feel like it, it does give you this God's eye point of view, right? So as you're, um, you're kind of like, uh, you're, you, we always relate things to our body, you know? So especially like, uh, um, you know, when we encounter like a work of art, we're always sort of like, that's how we, you know, I, I think that's how we sort of relate to it. Like how big is it? Um, these sorts of ideas. So anyway, you know, when it's a thumbnail, you know, you can just move your hand ever so slightly and you've covered the whole ground. You know what I mean? As opposed to like, you're doing some huge work of art or like a huge tattoo or something like that, you know, where, you know, it's going to take all this effort and you're not going to really get very far. So, um, the planning stages, the thumbnailing stages, I think are, um, I, it's something that it's easier said than done. You know what I mean? Because it really does like, it takes discipline to, to go through them. You know, you really want to get to the thing. You really want to get to the, to making the, you know, the work, you really want to get to the tattoo, whatever. Um, and so I think I've never regretted making thumbnails. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I've never regretted going through the, the design process. Um, mm -hmm. But again, just like you said, I think through trial and error and through hard earned experience, like you, you can look back and, you know, you're, you're like, oh, I, well, I could have done this or I could have done that. And these are, those are the questions I, you know, you want to try to, <laughs> you want to try to avoid that, right? You mm -hmm. go through it in the design phase, you go through the potential options in the design phase, and then um, you can be more confident when you, you know, when you're actually making that work. And that's, um, so yeah, I think that's, uh, that's the way I, you know, I want to do it. I want to be better at doing it. I want to do my due diligence. Um, and it is, it's, it's, again, it's just easier said than done, but you know, the more you practice it, the more, uh, probably the more that you can implement it as a, as a really, you know, uh, as a, as a really effective tool. So, yeah. Agreed. Yeah, man. You know, and then I think one of the other things that I approach and I wanted to talk about today too, is like, um, uh, let's see the color. You know what I mean? I feel like I've always struggled with color, understanding it and such, you know what I mean? And I think that I gravitate towards black and gray more just because it feels a little bit more natural to me. I have been, you know, trying to break out of that, that mindset and approaching things with the idea of color um, in a much more like harmonious kind of way, as far as color theory and things like that go. And I'm learning more about that, uh, more and more often, but I think for me, what I've found that works really well for me is, uh, when I do a drawing, no matter what I'm going to do, I am thinking of color, but I, I approach it in a black and gray, um, in a black and gray approach, no matter what, like I'll flush out the entire drawing with black and gray tones. Um, and then I'll be thinking about like the color values that I'm going to instill into those darker areas or like the medium tone areas or the lightest tone areas. You know what I mean? Um, what do you guys, do you guys feel that you do the same thing or do you guys kind of approach a, a, an image right away with the idea of exactly where the color is going to go? And does it fall into place a little bit easier for you just because you know a little bit more about color or how does it work? What do you think, Jason? So I, I like to play around a lot more with like uh, color temperature than I think a lot of other people. Um, for me, my first instinct isn't necessarily looking at it in like a, a contrast perspective or like a monochromatic perspective. Immediately, I'm thinking, what do I want to push forward? What do I want to push back? 
because that's going to determine where my warm and cool tones are, no matter what color it is. So immediately I'm thinking, where do I want to put emphasis? Um, you know, where's going to be my most saturated and pure color? Uh, what, because once you have that determined based on where you want people like the focal point to be, that's where your most saturated, your brightest and your most pure pigment should be. It's going to help draw the eye exactly where you want them to see. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, it's like, okay, well, I know if I want this bright, bright bumblebee yellow to really stand out here in this focal point, I know that this red area over here, well, that's going to get toned down. I know this blue over blue area over here, that's going to get toned down. This teal is going to get a bit dirtied up. Um, you know, these violets in the background, those are all going to get muddied up because I really want to maintain that that purity of color right where I want people to look. Um, you know, so immediately I'm not necessarily thinking about like contrast or, uh, you know, tonal value. I'm thinking more so about, or not tonal value. Sorry, I'm still waking up a little bit. Um, I'm not necessarily thinking about it in terms of like contrast. I'm immediately thinking about it in terms of where do I want people to look and what colors am I going to have to put around that to be complementary to that? Right. Right. And it's interesting that you brought up the yellow because that's exactly what I was thinking whenever I was trying to propose the question was like, you know, my lighter tones in the black and gray drawing would be things like yellow or oranges and things like that. You know, like the lighter scale, lighter tones on the scale, you know what I mean? Or hotter or most yeah, hot, more. you know what I mean? Yeah. Or most cool, right? And I, I agree. After hanging out with you, I've started like defining those colors in that kind of a term in temperature rather than like a, rather than like yeah. the scale, you know? So, yeah. It's helped out a lot. It's helped me out quite a bit, thinking of it in temperature for sure. And then like, and then again, being a tattoo artist, man, you gotta think about where's the black go? Where's well, the yeah. black, you know? Yeah. What do you think, James? Think, uh, color intensity is also a real, um, uh, it would be the next sort of thing, like temperature and intensity. Those are, you know, like those would be the uh, the things to try to balance. Um, like, so, like how neutralized is that yellow versus, you know, like, because you can have this really bright yellow and you can really contrast it with, with, with violet, you know, with a purplish tone, but like, you know, it doesn't have to be this, you know, like totally garish, like, you know, intense purple next to it. It could be, could be you know closer to ochre right like a, a neutralized yellow like some some yellow that's had violet added to it and i think so in doing um uh in in trying to balance balance things in that way uh, again you sort of you start to bring these you know uh, various levels of emphasis and then of course like you know um uh, you're, you're also going to balance the tonal value you're also going to balance like uh, the composition in, in certain ways, like, like we're talking about, uh, you were alluding to it earlier, like the only way that we can sort of see the, you know, the three dimensionality of the form is because we're introducing light to something two dimensional. And, and we're, you know, you want to push things back, you want to pull them forward. Um, but of course, like, we're, we're definitely going to have, you know, uh, more of that range of intensity of color of fullness of value like because it's closer to our focal point because our closer to our eye rather right whatever wherever the viewer is in relation to uh the objects within the, the you know the imagistic space the, you know the closer we are to that picture plane the, the where the viewer is actually located you know in relation to all that stuff that's where you get the, the you know the most intense value you know, the most intense color the most the most range of tonal value and and that sets a that sets the range right so you can push things way back in the back and you can have like mountains that are kind of warmish right but they're way far in the back they're they still have they're cool in you know they're cooled by blues and such and so um yeah, I mean, it's, it, uh, it is, it does get complicated, but it's this, it, you know, it's a simple relating of, of all those, um, 
uh, of those of those basic harmonies that you start to create, you know, this this visual music, right? A visual sort of uh, a, a space where there's there's space involved. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's it's hard. It's harder to talk about it. Really, it just sounds more like poetry than I guess than mm -hmm. like than practical. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, that's the crazy thing about color. That's the crazy thing about color, man. I've read books on it and stuff, dude. I've read like like theory on it and stuff, dude. And I'm just like, wait, I have to reread that entire last page again because I just got like lost, dude, entirely. But mm -hmm. I, I think I think what you're saying though is like in a simple form is usually where the light hits the object the most, that's gonna be the most intense part of the of the color range. So to speak. We're at like, you know, so we're always making an image based on some particular point of view. Yeah. Some, I mean, you know what I mean? Like there's always some, there's always an assumed spectator an mm -hmm. eye that's looking at the, that's looking at this, yeah. you know, a tattoo and a, and a drawing. Oh. And we're always assuming this, that there's a position of a spectator looking at something. And so we would arrange the space you know, in such a way that like, there's something that's close and then there's things that are further back and that, you know, um, so again, like if you, if you could have things that are extreme foreground and they could be, they may not get much light, maybe they get an edge light or maybe they're like in shadow or something like that. So they may be out of focus. Right. Um, so you're right. It's like, it's, it's where the light is touching, but also the relationship of, the viewer's point of, you know, a viewer's eye looking um, at the, at these subjects and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. It's, you have to think about that stuff. Um, I mean, if, if you, if you don't, then it's, then it becomes abstracted and idiosyncratic. Not that there's anything wrong with that. You know what I mean? Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's, you know, that those are playful spaces where, you know, like, it, like in 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 the early modern period, like uh, the Dutch paintings of, of, you know, like all the breakfast paintings, all the really sort of, you know, beautiful still lives and stuff, every single element was incredibly detailed. Why? So that way you as a viewer could look at this lobster shell and then you could go back and look at this, you know, engraved like metal piece or you can go back and look at all these objects and like look at them. You know what I mean? But if as soon as you step back and look at the composition, it's like, it's becomes very busy. This was just the trade off. It was yeah. known, you know what I mean? They knew what they were doing that. So do you create this harmonious sort of image where you have one focal point? This is what I think this is something we've been talking about today. Like you have this one sort of, you know, idea that gets pressed and everything else serves it. Right. Or are you, or is it a concept you're serving? Right. And all of the things, you know, are serving that, you know, and, and so each one is devotional, you know, is a meditation on this concept. Um, it's like people with uh, people with like with all the little tattoos all over, you know, what I mean? each individual one is a, is a sticker and they're each like detailed out. You can go and you can look at each single tattoo and like, that's a memory. That's this. I was there. I was that right. Versus a whole body suit. You know what I mean? I think it's not that either one is right or wrong. It's just that these are two different approaches to the creation of an overall image. And, and just, it's just the way that our minds work. We can't, we can only hold simplicity at once. So we're either looking at individual parts, right. Or we're looking at the whole thing sort of, bring it together and um i don't know i mean yeah that was really well put man i i like it. i agree with jason silent clap silent clap yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, was yeah I, always, uh, I tended to tell my clients that the placement is like a almost like a trailer to a movie you want to you only get that that the certain angle to catch what the entire tattoo is about like when you're doing a sleeve or whatnot like as a viewer, you're catching that one piece of that one snapshot in order to know what everything else is about. So that's what you want to, that's what you want to stand out and catch right away on the front part of it. Like uh, everything in the foreground is just the trailer to the movie, you know, without seeing the rest of the tattoo. That's cool. That's a good way to put it. Great way to look and at it. it.
it yeah. is true. Like, you know, it, it, if you got a big octopus going on and you only got one piece of a, a tentacle out front, and you, hell, that could be anything for that matter. Um, but it, it, it only interests them if they, if, if they can tell at least remotely what it is in order to like getting closer to see the rest of the movie, you know? Yeah. What's well, pretty cool because we're talking about priority now too. You know what I mean? Priority over subject matter. You know what I mean? And like, like the overall, the overall relationship to itself, especially the placement, yeah. especially the placement. Like guy talks about that a lot. You know what I mean? Like if you're looking at a half sleeve and you see some, some purple kind of weird bruised color looking out from the bottom of the, of the t-shirt sleeve, that's the only thing that you're going to see is like some weird color. You know what I mean? Like you have to, yeah. And I, and I remember not really thinking about it too much until I heard him start saying that, you know what I mean? It's like, you have to have, interesting parts throughout the throughout the composition but there has to be a sense of priority in order for the the piece to work as a whole too and i think color and placement and you know range and things like that are definitely crucial whenever we're approaching these images and things like that too and you know i'm sitting here thinking listening to james talk and everybody talk and for some reason i keep thinking about like these pictures of arizona sunsets you know what i mean for example you know, like way back in the mountain range, you'll see like these gray purples or these like light gray blues and things like that. And things kind of build up closer, the closer they come to us, the more intense that color range is and things like that. You know what I mean? So it's, that's, that's the way I kind of think about it. And I always try to like um, observe landscape paintings for that exact reason. You know what I mean? Especially when I'm thinking about depth um, in my images and things like that too. Um, and it's definitely sets a, a mood you know what I mean? It can definitely set a mood. It can definitely set the the timing and the tone of that you take in the image and things like that. So yeah. that's pretty cool. Uh, we did have tattoos by Chandler saying that he approaches things in a black and gray scale as well. And I think that that's worked out for it really well for me. What about you, Medusa? You're awake? You're waking up? <laughs> <coughs> Hi. <laughs> how do you feel about all this uh, i um i was listening to james earlier and i was like man dude i wish he was my dad i could use <laughs> i could use that wisdom in my life you gotta get up early and join us on uh, monday to, actually fun fact fun fact I actually woke up on Monday early AF and was all like, oh man, I should join the thing. And I turned uh, the live stream on on my TV and I watched you guys for about a total of maybe 12 seconds. Wait, that's right back. Oh, sorry. But you guys looked amazing and I thought about it, but then uh, I slept. Um, so sorry about that. But uh, yeah. No, uh, I'm agreeing a lot with what uh, James has been saying this whole time, especially when we're circling back to um, the thumbnails. <clears throat> They're a great idea, but I, when I try to do it, I don't have the discipline to do several thumbnails on a timer. It's really, really difficult for me, especially in guys' classes, even after doing it for like a year, I'm still struggling with the thumbnail part. Because as soon as I start sketching something down, I'm like, nah, this is it. This is it. And then I just want to go on that. I don't like to stop myself to make more thumbnails or to set timers. I don't have that discipline. I just want to go to the big project immediately. Um, I don't know if any of that's relevant. I've only had two sips of my energy drink so yeah that's what i was saying earlier that like uh, it's more of an idea for me as opposed to um like what, what jason said because th that's everything for him is to start off the thumbnails but for me i just i don't feel like i have the discipline either once i get the idea going then i'm all excited to get into everything else you know the bigger the bigger design yeah, um, I feel like that's also like, yeah, something that James is pointing to as well. Um, I, uh, I'm really excited to see 
how Jason's working process is in person. It's pretty it's cool. It's discipline, I bro. That'll be, I think that'll be really <laughs> a really teaching. What it was it's, it's supposed to be an adjective that means it teaches. <laughs> uh, is that what that means? Teachings, no, learnings, I, learners. So my just, my whole process kind of varies from client to client. Unless I'm working on like an art project for myself. In that case, it's more about just working on, you know, trying not necessarily to perfect a technical ability, but a lot of the stuff I do is more along the lines of like a color study or, um, you know, I, I try to go into everything that I do with a, a purpose in mind, for lack of a better term, right? Um, so, you know, first thing I want to do is identify a purpose. Like the, the tattoo machine painting that I started, um, well, I haven't even actually started it yet um, on uh, Sunday, the one I was getting all laid out and transferred over. I went into that with a specific purpose and idea in mind. Right. And I went into that saying, okay, well, I've never painted a tattoo machine before I've designed a few of them, but I, you know, sketched a few of them out, but never actually completed a painting of one. So I wanted to identify first and foremost, what is it I'm trying to tackle here? What is it I want to work on? What is my intention behind this? From there, it's like, okay, my intention is to create a clean, workable image. Um, with uh, an antique like toned background, a couple of little details here and there, but nothing too super crazy. But I always try to identify the purpose first, right? Same thing if I'm going to go through and I'm going to lay out a sleeve. It's like, okay, cool. Let's identify like what's going on here. What do we want to accomplish? What's our end goal? Um, guy comes in and says, hey, I want a sleeve. Cool. First question is, what do you want, right? Cause I'm not going to sit down and draw up a whole bio sleeve when they want koi fish. Right. So unless you know what the intention is, um, you know, you can take anything in any number of different directions and you can accomplish any number of different things. So identifying that intention is okay. Now we've got a direction to move in. Now we've got a focus. Now let's go through. Okay. You want one koi fish. Do you want two koi fish? Do you want water? Do you want, uh, rocks? Do you want, um, you know, maple leaves or cherry blossoms falling in the background? Let's start to identify these things. Once you have that, that concept, that, that principle, the, uh, the intention identified, that's when I can really start kicking into high gear and then moving outside of that. But without having that intention and that, that primary point of where I need to be focused, it literally the possibilities are endless. So I like to go into everything with that kind of a specific intention in mind. Um, that's where thumbnailing comes in, right? Okay, we've identified person comes in, they want koi fish sleeve. Cool. Now I can go through and I can say, okay, well, if we do two koi fish, we can lay them out like this. If we do three koi fish, we can lay them out like this. If you just want one big koi fish, like a monster, like, you know, super ancient, like 600 year old massive koi fish, <laughs> we can do that too. And here's how that could look, right? And we could have like the tail fin wrapping all starting down at your arm and literally have the body wrapping completely around your arm as it's twisting around your arm. That could look cool. Here's, you know, a couple of concepts for that. So once I have that intention in mind, that's where thumbnailing really, really helps me as far as like layout and composition goes, because someone comes in with a, an idea and a concept. There's any number of different ways to execute it, right? Um, you say you want, you know, I, I default to like Japanese imagery just because I'm, they work very large scale. So it gives you a lot of options. Say someone comes in and says they want a dragon sleeve. Awesome. Let's get into that a little bit more. There's a lot going on here, right? Dragon sleeves are awesome. I'm all about them. Do you want one dragon, two dragons? How about a double-headed dragon? That could be cool, right? Do you want claws prominent? Do you want 
primary emphasis on the head and like a claw? Do you want both claws to be prominent? What are you thinking about for background? Like what's, what's your concept here, right? Narrow down your possibilities, find your focus, find your intention. Once you've found that you have a positive direction to move in. And then once you have that direction to move in, that's when you can start to branch out a little bit more. But unless you've got that like focused direction to move in, literally your possibilities are endless. And to me, that's very daunting. It's very overwhelming. So I try to eliminate that entire like overwhelming stage um, to really help focus on what it is I'm trying to accomplish. Um, from there, it's like, okay, cool. We've got our concept down. Now it's time to go through and start laying things out. How do I want the waves to wrap? How do I want, you know, counter flow to go? What do I want to do with scales? Do I want to do black spots on the koi? That could be cool. That could be interesting. Um, oh, it's a cover up. Yeah. So we're going to add a whole bunch of those black spots in there. Great. Awesome. Now I know it's a cover up. Now I know I can go through and I know I'm going to have to adjust my color palette slightly. I know I'm going to have to adjust my composition to compensate for that cover up. So once again, to me, my primary thing is finding that intention, finding that focus and that point of concentration. From there, once I've got that origin point, man, I can take it off and I can run in any number of different directions. And you can change direction with style, right? You can go super traditional, you can go more neo-trad, you can go more realism. You can go in any number of different directions, but it all starts from that point of origin, that intention, that focus. So hmm. that's just kind of the way that I start out looking at things. That's a good way to, do, to look at it, man. It's a good way to do it. And this is me on like three sips of coffee. So if any of that was not coherent, I apologize. I'm also like triple multitasking in the background. So yeah. I've got a couple of things going on. I'm still trying to get my prints laid out for um for the next show I'm working at. I just I was up until two last night running prints. Um which I've got a brand new series of, it's two sheets that are 16 by 20. So they're pretty big. I didn't think yeah. they'd be that big. But, Dang, man. Yeah, it but it's five designs on each sheet. And I was thinking about just doing one big, like 16 by like 32 print, which could look cool. But I just thought it was too busy and too overwhelming. So I cut that down to a couple on each page and just blew the page up. And they look really nice, but I also want to provide some smaller ones. So now it's like, okay, now I've got to figure out what I want to do for the smaller prints, get those laid out correctly, start running those because time's running out. Um, and then it's like, okay, well, do I need to order paper? And, and so I've got like a thousand things going on in the background, but oh, if you guys want, I'll, show you a uh, quick little preview of what the prints are actually going to look like yeah absolutely let's check them out man i was gonna i was gonna ask if it's okay if we could see them too yeah i mean i already have them printed so if anyone wants to, wants any of these mm -hmm. um let me know and i'll run you off some otherwise i was only planning on running off like five of each doing a very small limited run me um, me yeah all right, yeah. I'll send you some. Cool. I already got a tube set and ready to be mailed out to you, so I might as well. Perfect. Just let me know and I'll Venmo. Out. I'll Venmo yeah. you. Bro. Let's check them out, though, man. Let me see if let, let me let see, me if, see if I can do the Jedi stuff. mind trick correct. <laughs> your money is no good here. <laughs> My money is no good there. Yeah, <laughs> it worked. I knew it. I knew I was it a worked. Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, dude. Here's half sheet. Two. Okay, cool. So here is do, 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 do. So this is uh the first sheet that I did. Yeah, dude. Trying cool. to play around with That's dualities great. and 
Nice. You know, I've got like poppies and like poison bottle over here, you know, and I've got some nice like brighter flowers with like love potion over here, a couple of different like ornamental heart designs um, with a symmetrical flower in the middle just to help provide a little bit of balance um, for everything that's going on. So, um, yeah, I really dig that the way that bottle at the bottom left hand corner, I really dig the way that one turned out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's one of my favorite designs. I think that would be an awesome tattoo. Well, once again, yeah, I, I, I go into all of this. My so my original intention behind this was just to come up with like fifteen to twenty brand new designs that I really want to tattoo at the show. And I was like, okay, well, a lot of people want to know what it would look like if it was fully rendered. So I'll go through and I'll do color renderings of all of these. Um, and keep in mind, when I draw them out, they're three by five, three inches yeah. by five inches. They are not the, you know, almost 10 inches tall that each one of these is. Yeah. So, wow. but that all comes down to like resolution, but that's planning in advance, right? Um, so drew all of these designs out and then I was like, okay, well, you know what? Some of these would make for great prints how do I want to do this? Right. And this is the other sheet that I, I printed out that I'm oh, doing, you know, once again, playing around with like two of a kind. So duality, having these guys both looking at each other and then mm -hmm. having two dragon claws in there. These, these two dragon claws were an absolute nightmare to lay out because they're both diagonal designs and you're trying to put them in like a quadrant right? That doesn't mm -hmm. usually lend itself to very good composition. Um, because you end up with a lot of open space top and bottom. So then it's like, okay, well, what do I do? How do I fill <clears> that <throat> up? So did the best I could with it. Um, the prints turned out absolutely incredible. Uh, way better than I had anticipated. So hopefully I saw them. Um, but mm. I've got those going on and I'm working on this little guy for one of the smaller prints, a uh, little eight and a half by 11 prints. Um, mm -hmm. Once again, this is another design. Ricardo, I remember you helping me out with like um, some of the ideas. Cause I had, I think I had just like a standardized honeycomb in the background that was all yeah. hexagon grids. And you mm -hmm. were like, dude, why don't, why don't you play around with that and change that up a little bit? Like yeah. make it less static. Yeah, it looks cool. It's very cool, man. So I think I'll run a couple of those off at, you know, letter sized. And I've got like a whole folder of other stuff that I can pull off that I didn't include on those two sheets. So I've always got another project going on somewhere at any given point in time. Mm -hmm. Man, busy. You've been a busy bee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got my new convention banner made, and I just got new stickers. Brand new stickers. Yeah, boy. And they're shiny. Yeah. Yep. Man, they shiny. love them. Shiny. People love those shiny stickers, dude. Hopefully they're they're like... them in Philly. Uh, hopefully. I should have plenty left. I got like 250 of them, so. Nice. And they're right. they're not they're not like super huge, but they're big enough that they should catch some attention. So that's cool. But they also match my banner because I like having everything be continuous. What is that's everybody's? Good. I'm I'm wondering what everybody's uh, um, convention circuit schedule is going to be for the next year. I'm trying to pick up a lot more traveling opportunities. I've been talking with Jason about that a lot and um, Lauren too. And I was wondering what your guys' plans are. Like Ricardo, are you, are you going to be doing any conventions or traveling? Uh, for me this year, I don't think so. I don't think I'm going to do very much traveling. I've gone down the guys a couple times this year. And earlier in April, we've gone out to uh, New Hampshire. Um, but I don't think I'm going to be doing too much this year. Yep. Um, uh, I did so much the year before 
that I have to kind of like catch up a little bit more, you know what I mean? And then like I was focusing on a lot of big projects and things like that here with my clients too. So it didn't really allow for financially. And then as far as time goes with tattoos, uh, allow for a lot of extra time for travels this year. Well, that's okay. Because last year we did it big. We did it real big last year. I think I was out in Philly area with Jason three times last year. Was it two or three? Sounds about right. Yeah, two or three. The first time we met. In the Philly convention. What's that? I think it was three times. Philly, Gettysburg, and then uh, when you came up to do that collab back piece. Yep. Nice. Yeah, I, uh, um, I have something almost once a month until February. Nice. Which is February, the oh. Philly convention. You should come up. It's actually uh, January this year. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. A month uh, earlier. I'm really excited because just a couple weeks ago, I mean, maybe a couple weeks ago, I don't know what day it is. Uh, maybe last week. I don't know. Recently, I hit my two year tativersary. Congratulations. Uh, and I know right. that's like nothing to you guys. And I'm just a baby, but I am really proud of myself for not like rage quitting and sticking through with <laughs> it. And I'm uh, celebrating yeah. by taking, saying yes to opportunities offered. Because fuck it, why not? That's so. scary sometimes, isn't it? But it's awesome that you're doing it, man. It's so scary, but I think as soon as I got that guest spotting at the same time as attending Health City and like 130 billion degrees weather <laughs> while taking care of my dog as well out of the way for a weekend, I was like, I, I can fucking do anything. Fuck yeah. yeah That's awesome agreed. to hear, man. Yeah, I've you. been talking to Derb about getting a guest spot over at red tree maybe sometime in february and um i'll see you in new Hampshire. no i'm still going out because i'll see you in new hampshire in april yeah and in december i'm gonna go check out the puerto rico tattoo convention wild man yeah. Puerto Rico is going to be awesome this year. Next month is the Needle Jig Northeast Meetup. So I think November and January are my only two empty months until April because I do have something in March that's not tattoo related. Um, but yeah. Might be tattoo related because I will be going to Oklahoma. So who knows? I might go swing by and say hi to Renee. There you go. That would be awesome. Yeah, I was wondering what everybody else's schedule is like, uh, so I could see if I'll be seeing any of you guys in person anytime soon. So Derb and I were messaging about you, Medusa, when I found out you were messaging him about a guest spot. So he's really excited to have you come. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. 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 I'm going to be like a shadow at Red Tree. We're excited to have you. Oh, that's, that's so nice. The people are excited. Oh, that's so sweet. You know, it cool. would be cool if you could work out one of your guest spots. Like, I know you've got a dog and responsibilities, but if you could work out one of your guest spots so you could like travel with us too, like, because, you know, we've got. True Tubes events and Red Tree events and things like that. But if you could work out a guest spot, like at the same, like to overlap when we're going up to Detroit together, the Motor City shows a blast, and we've got such a rad crew that we go up with. If you could, if you could coordinate <laughs> around a show like that, that would be even more fun. That would be really cool. I'd love to know what that schedule is. The only reason I was thinking February is because that's kind of when business starts picking up after the holiday rush. And after the New Year's resolutions, February is also my birthday month. So yeah, I was all like, get me out of here for my birthday. <laughs> I, I think the Motor City show is either at the end of February or beginning of March this coming year. I've looked at so many dates, everything blended together. But, but that would be a really cool thing if you could come 
come out and play with us and then travel and go on the road with us while you're out here. I would absolutely love that. Actually, like, I was just also texting Lauren yesterday. I was like, maybe I should just move out to the East Coast, like pull a Kyle Bernstein, man. Look how it worked for him. I'm tired, of, <laughs> tired of waking up at 6 a.m. just to see you guys on a short phone call. <laughs> I do happen to know that Derb would love to have more female tattooers on staff. I'm just throwing that out there. Anybody who's listening. We've got Corey <laughs> Lodge and um, Servena, obviously, but he, Derb, like, loves female tattooers and just loves encouraging us. And he loves, like, getting women together to, like, encourage other women. So it's a really neat thing. Um, so any, any female tattooers that are listening. We really like ladies at Red Tree. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. I city. The worst thing Wait. on this town. What? Hey, Fawn. Which... Fawn, what? do you know if they have uh, dates for Hell City this coming year? Do you know if that's been decided yet? It has. I should know hey, this... off my head, but I smoke they a lot. They posted them already, Jason. You can look on their story. They just posted it like yesterday. I know they did um yeah they're, they're accepting yeah uh, they did post it yesterday i seen it there i'm not missing that this year how city yeah <laughs> i mean even if you don't have a booth come out and play mm -hmm. that's what i did well i, I just need to make I sure did. i get my dates in for that because this past year there was a conflict with the studio owner so i manage the studio it's me and him we close we open we do everything and he was going to be out that entire two, like the week before and the week after, um, like the entire time he was gone. So it was up to me to run the studio in his absence. So I didn't even have the option to make it out this year because he was already going to be gone. Um, that's why I'm trying to get everything in in advance. This should be more than enough notice so that I don't have to miss that. <laughs> Um, and if for some reason something still comes up and I still can't make it, I'm going to be insanely pissed and I'll just close the studio. Um, <laughs> I'm not missing it this year. That That is not happening at all in any way. Um, Good. We're yeah. going to hold you to it. Yes. I'll, I'll, Jason, I'm excited I'll to see you my next weekend, tomorrow. though. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, resurrection. Yeah. Well, not. Yeah. So not this coming weekend, but the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, nice. Yeah. That's going to be awesome. I'm I've got like a whole new convention booth layout that I'm going to be playing around with. Um, like as far as like displaying merch and then business cards, the whole nine. It's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting because um, it's going to be the first time I'm trying this kind of a layout. But it it should work pretty well from what I think I've like I don't know I've been like brainstorming and thinking about this for like two months now like how do I want things to be displayed how do I, I can't do this like this because then that'll cut this off so it's like I always like the challenge of you know displays and like I love walking around at different shows and seeing the way that different people have things out um you know as far as you know do you want to buy merch? Do you want to buy a t-shirt? Do you want to buy prints? Do you want to, you know, do whatever? Um, so for me, it's always a challenge um, just seeing what other people are doing and like, what's the best way to come up with an idea on how to do this, but still maximize your space. Um, and that's that, where, like, just... Go ahead. I was going to say that's where true tubes really hit the nail on the head with um, those, uh, the like true tubes, like tray, and like their ink trays on like the little true tubes, like on the attachment for the armrest. Y yeah. Yes, I got one. It's amazing. Mind it's... blown. <laughs> like, how did such an obvious concept not already like exist? Holy fuck. Like, and I got <laughs> so jealous of Ricardo when he found someone at Philly one year that sold one. Uh, they had one, they were selling it. They were just trying to like offload it or whatever. And uh, he came back with it and I'm like, you asshole. Yeah. <laughs> it's you asshole. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Well, I didn't have an armrest, remember? So I had to go buy yeah. an armrest, and then they were selling that attachment with it. I was like, I'll take the whole bunch, please. <laughs> yeah, it works out I, great. Too. I still use I it just, at the shop too, man. I yeah. just recently got myself the true armrest. I love the swivel top. I love it so much. Um, and I got that little attachment. I got um, accidentally. I clicked the tray thing twice, so I got two trays. Um, so one of them's at work and one of them's in my bathroom where I put my makeup that I never yeah. use. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's like first day that I got it after assembling everything, everybody in the shop was like a little, a little envious of me. <laughs> I felt like daddy. <laughs> Armrest yeah. daddy. When you come to Red Tree Medusa, I can show you my setup. It will blow your mind even more. I'm stoked. Yeah, but oh yeah, I wanted to circle back around the uh, idea of going to conventions just to play. Like, I don't expect to be at a skill level or to be invited to work any conventions anytime soon. But I'm trying to hit up as many as I can for networking purposes, for playing, for hanging out with people, just like I did at Hell City. I wasn't working at Hell City. I got a, a guest spot in town just down the street. Now, the cool thing about going, traveling for conventions just to play and not actually having to work them is that you can leave. You can leave when you're tired. Yes. <laughs> I, found, I found a corner at Hell City, like this little <laughs> closet that didn't have a light in it, but had a water fountain. I could go there anytime I was overstimulated and my like, power <laughs> down. And then, uh, yeah, when the night was getting down and everybody was settling out, I could just hail a cab and be all like, bye. <laughs> I'm out. Or yeah. hit the grocery store. Yes. Spend a lot of money at the grocery store because we were avoiding spending a lot of money at the restaurant. Mm. Lauren and I had the most amazing um, salad thing yeah that's pretty funny <laughs> i bought <laughs> guys I always bought, bring food to conventions just in case yeah pop tarts uh, yeah. yeah pop tarts for sure right jason pop pocket knives and avocados pocket knives avocados, pocket knives, avocados. Yeah. i actually bought cotton candy grapes recently and i thought about you lauren they so are good. so good oh. those yeah, things are, are great yeah cotton yeah, candy I didn't grapes, like them. amazing i didn't like them there Jason, Jason, what? they were too well, sweet Jason. for me. You're All right, wrong. that's it. Show's over. <laughs> Bye -bye. <laughs> and on that note, I do have to get going because I got an all-day appointment. I gotta head to the studio and prep for. It, so likewise. Yeah, this could, has been a blast. Guys. Couldn't get behind the cotton candy. Yeah, really, Jason. Yeah, but you can get behind it. the pop tarts. So we're good. Oh, I think yeah. we're gonna leave I it on a sour note. <laughs> they had pop tart grapes. Mm. That even be better. Oh my god! Can you imagine? Pop tart grapes. You just smash oh, them together. Of them. every flavor. Ah. Well, well, cool. We want to start uh, giving some sign-offs here, Jason. Go ahead and start with you since you got to go. Oh, you guys don't have to stop. But um, if anyone I, wanted to get a hold of me, you can always reach out to me on, uh, on Instagram at Philly Inc. You can find me on Sundays at 1 p.m. Eastern time for the Skill Building Sunday Drawing Group. Uh, here live at the Reinventing the Tattoo Network. Thank you everyone for having me on today and for a great discussion. Sorry, I'm still a little bit tired, but you know, <coughs> that happens sometimes. So um, yeah, thanks a lot, everyone. Take care. Hope everyone has a great day today. Take it easy, man. Thanks for joining. Hi, Jason. Later, Gator. Amber. Sure. As always, I'm Amber Morgane. You can find me on Instagram under Amber Morgane and on Facebook under Looking Glass Inc. I N K or under Amber Morgane Originals. Killer. Thank you for joining again today. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I love it. Yep. See you, Amber. Whitney. Whitney, how can uh, we get a yeah. hold of you? Thanks a lot for having me, guys. Um, you can get a hold of me at ironworldstattoo.inc. Um, or you can uh, get a hold of me on Facebook at, at Iron Rose Tattoo Company. Uh, and there's ironrosetattoo.com too. Um, 
Thanks a lot for having me. I, uh, I'm sorry I'm late, but hopefully next time I'll get there in time to have a better discussion with you guys. No, it was awesome having you. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. Yep. Medusa. Hi, I'm Medusa. Let's keep chatting after the boys leave. And uh, you can... <laughs> 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 and you can catch me at medusaslaves.com and um also on instagram medusa slaves with the yeses at the end that cracks me up every time man every time me too i, ha I have to <laughs> i have to sound it out there's three s's at the end on the instagram one because apparently there's already a Medusa slaves with like four pictures and no followers that won't respond to my messages Medusa, I have remembered your Instagram handle from the very first time you said it when we were at Jiminy Peak last year together. Like, oh, God. Yeah. yeah. Please, with three S's. I was like, golden. Yep. <laughs> like, it's, it's like Medusa slays. <laughs> Just so you guys know. <laughs> Killer. Uh, Fawn, would you like to say something? Uh <laughs> You guys can find me at fawn underscore baker on instagram or you can catch me every thursday at 6 p.m uh with tattoo collecting 101 we talk about tattoos we talk about all kinds of stuff but tune in learn by accident <laughs> killer james cool uh, thanks, Ricardo, for having me, and uh, thanks, everybody, for a great conversation today. I'm James Wisdom. Uh, you can find me on uh, Monday mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern. Uh, Drawing for Tattooers is the show. Um, and everybody's welcome. Really, uh, the more the merrier, really. So, uh, again, uh, thank you so much, everybody. We'll uh, see you soon. Yeah, killer, man. Thank you for joining. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, my name is Ricardo Sardivant. Uh, you guys can catch me here every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, you can get a hold of me on Instagram at Ricardo Sardivant. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today. I appreciate the conversation. It was great. Um, I always look forward to seeing everybody and participating. Um, again, Lauren, thank you so much for all your technical help. Couldn't be here without you, girl. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, the replay will be up on Reinventing the Tattoo. Also, a lot of these replays, don't forget to find on our Roku channel. Um, put it on in your in your workstation or in the front. Um, and we'll see you guys all again next week. Peace. Bye. Bye, everybody. See you, Medusa. Bye. Hey, hit me up later, Bye. Medusa.